we just went through 1 John 5, one of my favorite passages, 9 through 13. Good to master that because it clarifies a lot of ideas that people have about the gospel that just aren't there. Uh, so we'll move on down to a passage in the first chapter of the epistle of John. 1 John 1, 1 through 4. <clears throat> this goes back to corroborate the reasons why we have a secure, wholly reliable testimony of who Jesus Christ is. You say, well, I, I, I believe the Bible. But the Bible was written by 40-some-odd authors. And those who wrote of him, either in the Old Testament times or especially in the New Testament times or the first century who wrote it in Greek they were actually eyewitnesses this is amazing because then they wrote down what they experienced so when somebody says well you know the Bible is written and rewritten and set and reset but the problem with that is these people don't write and rewrite because they're eyewitnesses so 1 John 1 1 to 4 is key to understanding and keep at the top of your mind when you're sharing your faith and people discredit the Bible. What John and fellow apostles have seen and heard, they proclaim also to John's readers and all those who have believed in the name of the Son of God to become children of God, born of God, so that they too may have fellowship with the apostles. And indeed, the apostles' fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, which fellowship readers and all children of God, born of God, may have as well. This is the stated purpose of the epistle. And actually it's the stated purpose or the indirect or implied purpose of all the books of the Bible. Some have inspired messages written thousands of years before the first century, the prophets especially, and they testify to who Jesus Christ is that they're looking forward to, Hamashiach, the Messiah to come, the promised one especially in the book of Isaiah. And Moses wrote of him in Deuteronomy. So here's, here are the verses that are uh, in, with 1 John 1, 1 through 4. The Young's literal translation, 1 John 1, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes, and that which we did behold in the sense of a gazed intently upon, and our hands did handle concerning the word of life. These are men who actually did these things. This isn't poetic. This is actual. 1 John 1, 2 in the New American Standard Bible. And indeed, the life was manifested. This is an individual person. The word of life, Jesus Christ. And indeed, the life was manifested. And we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life. They're not looking to Jesus in his humanity only when they say they heard, see, saw uh, with their eyes, behold, gazed intently upon, hands did handle, and concerning the word of life. They are referring to his other essence also, the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. John, author John in his gospel, John 1.1, 1, 1, says, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning of all time and creation, before that, he already was the word. And the Word was with God, face to face on an equal level. And God was the Word, the eternal life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaimed to you. Oops, I'm in little trouble with this. Let's see, go back to it. Okay. As soon as I put my hand on this very sensitive pad here moves all over the place. The purpose of the letter is stated in 1 John 1 to 4 to inform his intended readers, children of God, born of God, that just as the apostles were in fellowship with one another, together as they lived physically in the first century and with God and God the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ, so the readers and all children of God, born of God, may have fellowship with them and with the Father and his Son. For author John's intended audience is those who have believed in the name of the Son of God who unto eternal life. 
children of God, born of God, who are already secure in their salvation, whom he calls my little children, in 1 John 2, 1. So this is not a salvation book. This is a book addressed to believers who move on, who are born of God because they believe Jesus is the Christ, 1 John 5, 1, and they become born of God. What do you do with that? This is how you move on, to have fellowship with God. Look at 1 John 2, 1. The audience of this epistle, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. You don't talk to an unbeliever like that. You talk to them about having eternal life, have their sins paid for so they can have them be forgiven through faith. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If you have the, Jesus as, the right, uh, as, as your advocate with the Father, then you already have become a believer. The first part of 1 John 2, 1, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, further establishes to whom the first of epistle of John was written, since unbelievers are hopelessly enslaved to sin, Romans 6, 17 and 20, and since only children of God, born of God, therefore, would be in a position to not sin, then the intended audience of this epistle must be those who have trusted alone in Jesus Christ alone for eternal life, as author John described as, my little children. Let's see if the umbrella will help. Oh, yes. Now I can see the text better. This is further confirmed by the final phrase of 1 John 2, 1. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, which confirms that, confirms that Jesus, the children of God, which confirms the children of God, born of God, are in view in this passage. For unbelievers first must become children of God, born of God by believing in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, unto eternal life in order to have him as an advocate with God the Father when they do sin. Look at the uh, Gospel of John here, John 1, 12 to 13. But as many individuals of his own creation, John 1, 11, a, as these are people, not rocks or trees, but as many individuals of his own creation as did receive him, to them he gave authority to become sons, literally children of God. How do you receive him? It's qualifying here to those believing in his name. John 1 John 3, 1 to 2. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And such we are. And for this reason the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has now appeared as yet what we will be. We look forward to that especially in these difficult days. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because he will see him, we will see him just as he is. We see scripture, we read scripture, we can imagine. Uh, but uh, to really know him as he is, scripture especially gives us insights, but we'll actually see the reality when he appears. It appears in the, in the, in the clouds above to take us home to be with him to be like him, righteous as he is. Compare 1 John 2.12. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. How did you get forgiveness? Simply by believing. Note that only believers have the status wherein their sins are forgiven them relative to eternal life. <laughs> you can look at Acts 10.43. There's so much corroboration. So the subject of the first epistle of John is the exhortation to the reader of believers to live a holy and righteous life resulting in fellowship with God. Well, you can't do that under your own auspices, so that's why in the first John chapter one, verses nine, verse nine, if we confess our sins, we believers, God is faithful to his promise and just because his son has died for the sins of the whole world, so he can do this justifiably. So God is faithful and just to forgive us these sins that we've confessed. And not only that, purify you from all unrighteousness, and you have the righteousness of God credited to your account. So move on in the temporal life. Until you sin again, and then what do you do? Acknowledge it by confession, 1 John 1, 9. This could not apply to what one must do to receive eternal life, since acting righteously, in other words, keeping God's commandments, are not part of receiving eternal life, as we just read in 1 John 5, 9-13. 
nor are they absolutely trustworthy. Our acting righteously is not absolutely trustworthy. We are untrustworthy at best. 1 John 1 8 says, If we say we have not sinned, we're liars. And in 10, we have no sin, we make God out to be a liar. <clears throat> so, continuing on with 1 John 5 13, which says, These things I wrote to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life unto believing on the name of the Son of God. So, the phrase that begins 1 John 5, 13, these things I wrote to you, refers to the testimony of God that eternal life is in His Son through a moment of faith alone in Him alone, which John wrote about to those who have believed on the name of the Son, children of God, born of God. So we've already done that, and he's reminding us what we have done and the, and the grand, grand results of that. We have assurance in this temporal life, which is so uncertain. And this is so that as they, they determined to recall that they believed on the name of the Son of God for eternal life, we, believers, they may know that they have eternal life and continue to believe so that they may then be better enabled to choose the means available to them, us, to have fellowship with him and with one another according to Scripture, the subject of John's epistle. <clears throat> Despite remaining in mankind's fallen condition, which we are, Children of God, born of God, who are assured of their salvation unto eternal life by just recalling that they believe, may walk in fellowship with God by walking in a light, not according to. We attempt that, but it's not going to be successful. 1 John 1, 8 and 10. We're walking in the light of God's absolute righteousness, viewing Him as absolute righteousness, and that's the goal that we have to look to and we find ourselves falling short of it constantly, we confess. Not according to it in sinless perfection, but walk in the light of God's absolute righteousness in the sense of acknowledging that God is perfect light, absolute righteousness. And we see that in 1 John 1, 5 to 7. We can review 1 John chapter 1. It's important when you go into these later chapters in this epistle, for example, you're completely familiar with the first four chapters before you move into 5. And point two, acknowledging their sinful shortcomings by stipulating what they are before a holy God. What happens when you miss some? You say the ones that are on your mind. And what does God do so graciously? He purif purifies you from all unrighteousness. Not just forgive you the sins that you confessed. Doesn't leave the other ones unforgiven. Uh, no, it purifies you from all unrighteousness up to that moment. And you're just in position just as righteous as Christ is move on. And then you intend to move away from things that would get you caught up in those things that you have to constantly confess. And while we, believers, are walking in that light, the light of God's righteousness, we can know that we are righteous and discern righteous acts in others, not by what we feel, such as by some kind of supernatural power taking control of us, like an expression of an imagined spiritual gift, as some contend, but by trusting in what Scripture says about the matter. It's all about what Scripture says in a plain, careful reading of it. To begin with, Scripture says that the blood of Jesus, 1 John 1, 7, God's Son, cleanses each of us from the temporal sin that we have, are, are acknowledging, that we have acknowledged, and from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 5 to 10. So whatever children of God, born of God, do in the name of God while they walk in the light of God's absolute righteousness in accordance with that which they have properly learned from Scripture, albeit imperfectly, their, our deeds, their deeds will be purified from all unrighteousness and be acceptable to God for eternal rewards at judgment. This is true when children of God, born of God, endeavor to do the following. Study. Abide in God's word. Be careful to keep his commandments. And when you don't, confess. And thereby abide in God, Jesus Christ. Hence walk in the same manner as Jesus Christ by the grace of God. Because it's by the grace he credits us with perfect walking even though we uh, haven't done that, simply by admitting to God, well, I haven't done that perfectly, <clears throat> and telling what it is. And two, point two, determine what to say to others from Scripture. By reading 1 John 2, 14 and 24. That's the second chapter that's important. Care for the unsaved and share their faith with them with agape godly love. 2, 24, Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Express agape godly love toward the brethren. 